Hey guys, welcome back to the channel today. I'm in Westfield again, and I'm working on the house that's over 100 years old. I believe it was built in 1920, so 102 years old. Today I'm working in the detached garage, and there's a bunch of knob and tube that we're gonna disconnect. It's still connected, and I believe the new wiring from the main house to the detached garage is done in UF. I don't know the depth. I'm not too concerned with that at the moment. Uh, but today we're gonna rip out all the old knob and tube and replace it with a couple new ceiling lights, a couple new garage door receptacles. And of course, we're gonna take the old disconnect fuse box that was out here originally, that's connected to the knob and tube and replace it with a junction box for an on off switch for a disconnect for the garage. And then we're gonna put in two switches, one for the overhead lights and the other one for the outside. Uh, we're gonna do a double flood out here. And then um, we're also gonna put a GFCI convenience receptacle and uh, that's what this video will be about. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And again, thanks for being here and watching this video. Okay, so the first order of business here on this job is to open up and see what's behind this box here. Now this looks to, to me like an old Edison-based fuse box that might have been put in in the 1940s, 1950s. It has since been removed. The fuses have been removed. And as you can see, they've just spliced right through without any overcurrent protection for anything inside this garage. We're gonna fix that today, but before we do anything, I wanna see what kind of power I have out here. Make sure it's 120 volts from hot to ground and 120 volts from hot to neutral. This way I know when I add new stuff to this circuit, it's gonna be wired correctly and have the proper voltage. What I'm doing here is I'm using this red vinyl electrical tape to mark my switch leg. So with the power coming into this detached garage, there's another piece of UFR. So there's two cables coming outside from the house. One's the constant power and the other one is the switch leg. And so with the red vinyl tape, I'm using that to identify these conductors. So when I tie in at the end of the day, I know which is which. The switch leg is going to control our new outside double flood light bulb holder. Uh, right now there's a keyless light there connected to the knob and tube. And uh, of course, we're doing away with all the knob and tube in this garage and installing new. So that's what this uh, switch leg does. So I'm working with live conductors here, just being very careful. There's two UF, they were in good condition. The insulation had not deteriorated, it was good. And we had proper voltage and proper grounding, so I'm all set. Now I feel safe here, but I gotta take the lock nut off in order to take this box out. I really prefer doing work like this. Um, we call this old work, remodeling, rewiring. Um, I worked for several contractors when I first started. Uh, we were wiring townhouses and, um, and condos. But that got real boring real fast. They were very cookie cutter. Um, there maybe been like three or four different models of these townhouses or condos and you basically did them like a Lego set. It was the same thing over and over and that was kind of boring so uh, when I went to go work for a contractor around 1994 or so uh, we started working in existing houses and rewiring kitchens and bathrooms and that sort of thing and um, he really showed me the ropes and uh, I learned from the other guy that worked there too a lot of the uh, stuff I still do today uh, 200 amp service upgrades you know somebody had to teach me along the way and uh, I'm very fortunate that I had some good electricians teach me along the way. All right, so here, um, I cut that sheet of plywood so I could mount my boxes to it instead of just mounting to the sheeting on the uh, inside of the garage wall. <clears throat> and uh, I'm making a hole here for that existing wiring um, to go through the uh, plywood here and into the back of the box. It's a three quarter inch nipple sticking out of the wall and so uh, just want to give it a nice base to um, mount the four and square boxes I'm about to mount. I'm a huge fan of that two foot level there, that climb level. It uh, doesn't have a light but um, more and more as I move forward here I use my the uh, the box level, the two-foot level, um, draw straight lines, draw plumb lines, uh, 
I use it a lot more often. This is the uh, Milwaukee M12 um, <clears throat> bandsaw. It's fantastic. For years, I didn't use a bandsaw. I would just use a hacksaw or a sawzall to cut it, and before that, even a hacksaw. Uh, but I haven't used those in a while since I bought this bandsaw to cut the EMT. If you're going to do the work, do it right. So here I'm bending some EMT and I need to get, I need to put in a box offset to get into that four inch square box. And then I also need to bend a three and a half inch offset to go around the top plate at the top of the wall, which you can't see because I have the garage door open. Um, but I will show that to you later on in this video to see uh, what I do. And so there's going to be two pieces of EMT going up the wall. The one piece of EMT is actually going to go to a junction box, which is going to house the wiring for the two keyless lights that I'm going to install. And the other circuit will be for the two garage door opener receptacles, which will also be mounted near those lights. So both of those MC cables will go into a junction box and then we'll sleeve some uh, THHN down this EMT into our box <coughs> to get power. Yeah, so there was a lot of junk in this garage, and I had to move a bunch of stuff around to get this work done. Um, but it was a beautiful day, and um, I eventually put my AirPods on, and I just listened to some 70s on 7, and maybe some Eddie Trunk at 3 o'clock when he comes on. Uh, this is my ideal type of work day here. So right here, we'll do a, a short box offset, and I never measure for that. It's just um, I've done so many. I just do this by feel. <clears throat> and then I'll take some measurements and I'll do another um, offset. Uh, the, the, the second offset's a little bit more because the conduit going up the wall on the left hand side, uh, if it goes straight up it would hit a rafter. So I make the offset a little bit larger than it needed to be just so I can um, have it going off to the left a little bit. I hope that makes sense so that it's out of the way. And that second piece of conduit on the left will be where the switch leg wiring MC cable will go down the conduit <clears throat> for the outside front uh, double flood lamp holder which you'll see in a little bit. Half inch and three quarter inch EMT bending isn't very difficult um, but it does take a little bit of practice so if you're watching this video and you'd like to learn how to bend half inch EMT conduit I would suggest you buy 100 feet of half inch EMT, which would probably run you about, gee, I don't know, maybe $60 now. I mean, like 10 years ago, it was like 20 bucks. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but that, it was cheaper than it is now. And uh, just start bending. Um, there's all kinds of charts online. Uh, I would suggest maybe getting Uglies, the Uglies book. They sell it at Home Depot, and there's charts in there for measurements on how to make your bends here I like to use the 30 degree bend marks uh, because the math is simple it's just times two for your bends okay so here you see the bends that I had to make around that top plate with the joist or rather the rafter right up above where I was working but that's the bends that I had to make. So what I'm doing here is I shut that garage door and I'm going to run a, a piece of 12-2 MC cable. Now you could use 14-2. I like to keep 12-2 on my truck in case I need to run a 20 amp circuit. Instead of having two rolls of MC cable, I just use 12-2. Um, and if you don't know what MC cable is, MC cable is a light uh, armored cable that actually has an enclosed uh, insulated equipment grounding conductor. So you got a black uh, hot conductor, a white neutral conductor, and an insulated um, new, uh, 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 equipment grounding conductor. So I keep 12-2 on the truck. And so I'm taking away some of the old wiring that's there first, and then eventually I like to run the wiring up top where maybe it's concealed a little bit and out of the way uh, so there's no physical damage to it. I use the MC cable in an exposed garage like this just to prevent any physical damage 
from happening from, to the cable. So yes, I'm not kidding. What we see there is a keyless light fixture on the outside. This is connected to the old knob and tube. So at some point when this was installed, I imagine it was a replacement. I don't think it was original with the house. But to think that somebody thought it was okay to put this open keyless light fixture without a box on the garage like that and call it a day, just wow. Um, you're obviously not an electrician, definitely don't have a license, that's for sure. And uh, I'd imagine it was either the painter or an old carpenter that repaired that. It might have been like that originally. I don't know. All right, so what I'm going to do there is put in this bell box, okay? And in this bell box, we'll put up this three lamp holder and we'll put in two floodlights, bulb holders on each side. In order to do this correctly, you must put a connector on the back of that bell box. And since I'm using the MC cable, the connector is a little large. So I need to take out my chisel and make sure it's large enough so the box is flush up against the garage surface there. In the industry, the nickname for this box is a bell box, like I said. And that's the name of the manufacturer that used to make them. The real name for these is just a weatherproof box, an exterior box, <clears throat> and it's rated to be used outdoors. Uh, so you might use these for GFCI receptacles, outside lights. There are alternatives to using this box, but in this particular situation, this was the best choice to mount the two flood holders. I was just told to do a no frills type of installation, just so there's lights on the back of this house, and uh, so that's what we did. So I make sure that connector is tight and then uh, we'll attach this bell box, the uh, weatherproof box, to the garage. Once we get the box mounted, we'll uh, put together the floodlights onto the three lamp holder and we'll mount the three lamp holder to the bell box. I'm using two inch core screws that are um, corrosion resistant. Those are the gray ones you see at the Home Depot. They're two and a half inches long and they're going through what looks like two pieces of three quarter inch uh, lumber there. So inch and a half through. And of course, make sure you bond the box. That means wrapping the ground wire around the ground screw that's provided with the box. That's a very important detail. All right, so here I like to assemble the flood bulb holders, obviously not on the ladder, but standing here on the level surface in the ground in the garage. And then uh, we'll pre-wire these and we'll go up there and we'll attach it to the box and then we'll put in some bulbs and we'll be all set with these double flood lamp holders. And I think after that we broke for lunch. Good idea. On this three hole uh, cover plate that I'm putting on here, two of the holes are being occupied with the flood, hole the flood holders. And of course they come with a, um, with a blank that also threads in there in the middle. Um, but unique to this particular piece of equipment is actually a ground screw attached to it. You have to bond that as well. And so uh, and when it's in a position like this, which it normally won't be, it'll still be connected to the grounding system. It'll be bonded. If you're doing this yourself, make sure you use that gasket that they give you that goes between that cover plate and the box. That's pretty important in keeping water out. This is in a spot of the soffit though where I don't feel that the water will get in there easily. <clears throat> but you never know. And of course I got to do it. So what I'm installing here are PAR38 LEDs. These are the equivalent to 90 watts uh, halogen. They are 1200 lumens and they have a 3500 Kelvin temperature rating. Speaking of Kelvin temperature rating, how many of you people out there, when you buy light bulbs, you look at the information on them besides the wattage and uh, maybe the, if they say daylight on them. Um, if they do say daylight on them, that's a very high Kelvin temperature. That's going to make your lights 
whatever you're trying to light up look very sterile in my opinion uh, almost like a doctor's office or a dentist's office or even an office space what you're looking for inside a house inside a house or is somewhere around 3000 anywhere from 2700 to 3500k around your house there's really no need for anything higher than that and i think it's important that you try to match those kelvin temperatures no matter where you're working in the house so maybe your landscape lights on the outside and you have two coach lamps by the front door um, you want to have those match the same kelvin temperature so if one's 2700 and the other one's 3500 they're just going to look different and it's not going to be as appealing So I read the comments and I actually learn a lot from those comments. So keep them coming. That's good. Some comments aren't as nice as others, um, but that's okay. I can take it. Um, <clears throat> but one of those comments was, how come you don't splice your conductors together with pigtails uh, for receptacles? And, th and that's fine. You could do that if you want to do that. I don't think that's necessary. I think I make a good termination and I use the, the device um, to bridge the circuit. But when I'm doing these keyless lights... There's only one terminal for neutral and one new, one terminal for hot. So I have to pigtail if I have a feed in and a feed out situation like I have here. I am such a believer in the headlamp that I'm using here. It's made by Milwaukee, and as you can see, I love Milwaukee. I got so much stuff, even my hammer here. And I, I used an S-Wing for years, um, but I'm not sure what happened to my latest one. It's probably on my truck. I just started bringing this one to work with me. Um, this headlamp is 600 lumens on high, so it takes a USB lithium battery, and I'm not sure the size of the battery as far as how long the amp hours. Uh, but as you can see, it makes my work real simple. Uh, I can see what the heck I'm doing. Because uh, usually I'm working in a crawl space or up in an attic, and a lot of times I don't have a lot of light. That's why I'm there. I'm an electrician. I'm there to bring the light. So I got to have lights on me all the time. Uh, I do like to use the GoPro head mount, uh, but not as much. I'm noticing a lot of people don't seem to like that, and I kind of don't like it now that I've seen it a few times. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to do it to explain something that I'm doing. But I do like to have this headlamp on most of the day. And so I got about seven or eight batteries in case um, the battery goes dead and I got a charger on board and everything. But <clears throat> this headlamp definitely helps me. I can see what I'm doing. And uh, definitely a great headlamp. So I like to use the metal box, obviously, with the MC cable. I think you could probably get away with using a plastic box with the MC cable, being that... The equipment grounding conductor is provided, and you're not using that jacket as a grounding path. Um, but I like using these metal boxes. I think it looks nicer. It's sturdier, and overall, just a nicer, better, higher value job with the metal box and the porcelain light fixtures. Of course, you can use a plastic box and the plastic keyless fixtures. Um, I don't like those, though. I just be careful with these. The porcelain... If you tighten down these screws too hard, just, just for reference, um, you could break the porcelain. I know that from experience, and uh, it's been a while since I break one, but, um, and, and the porcelain fixture is a little bit more money too. Um, <clears throat> but obviously they resist uh, electrical current from flowing on them, but they might crack. So you got to be careful when you tighten up these screws here through the keyholes on the holder. So here's my junction box for the, um, the two ceiling lights and for the two receptacles. And so I've snaked up some THHN, snaked up four conductors. I'm using the red for my lights and I'm using my blue 
for the receptacles and of course I ran an equipment grounding conductor and a shared neutral for both of those loads. This is on top of the ladder and the wiring to the left right there is that garage floodlight that we put in earlier. As you can see I just stripped back the MC cable and, and, um, <clears throat> and pushed it down the conduit. Of course I got the what's known as a from to connector on the top of that conduit on the left. That tightens down uh, the connector to the conduit and it also clamps the MC cable and uh, that's a code requirement. Now this is obviously down below where I'm going to be putting in a uh, tamper resistant GFCI receptacle and a decor style switch uh, only because I like to use these um, block block four inch square covers so normally wouldn't put a, uh, a fancy decor switch out in the garage but it just made sense here I thinking about it I probably should have done a decor switch on the left box too because that's going to be my main switch my main shutoff for the garage power that's required by the code I think in one of my earlier videos with the shed wiring I didn't do that. It's not that big a deal. Uh, the inspector didn't catch it either, so it's not that big a deal. But you should have a shutoff for any time you run wiring to a new structure, like a, like a detached garage or a shed. That is a code requirement. Another code requirement we could talk about here is um, obviously these metal boxes. You want to bond them with the equipment grounding conductor. Uh, the length of the conductor is outside the edge of the box, so they got to be a minimum of three inches outside of the box. Um, and uh, usually, when I usually I do more than that, um, when they come out of the connectors coming in, they got to be a minimum of six inches. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I wouldn't take a tape measure to measure that. I usually put my fist up against the box, and I cut maybe an inch past my fist and that's usually enough conductors and there you can see we got our proper voltage I turned off the disconnect switch it makes that green light blink that means that the power has been off uh, then what you want to do is you want to turn it back on the solid green light you want to test your GFCI now too that's a really nice tester from Klein it also gives you the voltage uh, it takes a few it takes about six or seven seconds for the GFCI test function to reset itself before you're able to retest the second receptacle. So there it is. So we got the disconnect switch that disconnects power to the whole garage. It's required by the code. It's done. Uh, then we got the switch connected from the inside to work the new floodlights, which we're going to check in a minute. And um, obviously the GFCI works. The only thing left we have to test are the two receptacles for the garage door openers. And of course, we're gonna put some bulbs into those, uh, those keyless lamp holders that we put in and make sure that the switch inside the garage here turns them on and off. All right, so the switch is on for the two lamp holders that we put in. So when I plug this light in, the lights should be on. Looks good. And here's the light. All right, so that's good. See that? And the lights obviously are strategically placed in an area where when the garage doors are open, won't affect the light. Thanks for watching this video, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Hope you learned something. I went back to this job a few days later, then I ripped out all the old knobs and the old tubes and the old wiring from the old wiring system. Guys, I think I'm coming up on 2,000 subscribers, and I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, I really appreciate you guys watching these videos, and I'm, I'm glad you enjoy them. There'll be more to come in the future. Have a great day. Take care.